Hello Watch Enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler. In this podcast, um, and indeed the video which will be uh, posted at the same time on YouTube, I have a few important announcements to make. Now, watches are a fantastic um, uh, catalyst for uniting people, to be able to speak with each other about something interesting um, and a shared hobby and passion. And events in the UK, like uh, Time for a Pint and Red Bar, have developed fantastic followings and form a really wonderful way for people to simply spend time together chatting about wristwatches. However, um, in recent uh, years, there's become a, a certain disconnect between brands and the enthusiasts who so love them. Um, and even in events which are currently um, offered to people, um, there is no longer the there is, is no opportunity to be able to speak directly to a brand and ask all the questions you would want to and expect answers. And so I'd like to announce today an event which will be taking place in London in a couple of weeks on the 17th of, um, of, uh, of March. And this event will be something different, something new. Um, now, it will be a ticketed event because of the demand which has been expressed by people for such an event um, amongst those living in the UK and in London specifically as a hub of watch interest. And this will be an event hosting Zodiac. Now, the vast majority of you will know Zodiac as a Swiss brand owned by the Fossil Group, which is producing a remarkable range of watches, um, some really fascinating pieces from the incredibly popular Super Seawolf um, to a variety of other pieces. Um, and they're a relatively misunderstood brand in terms of their, their production numbers being very small, but the demand being very large and the quality being phenomenal. And the idea of this event is to be the opportunity to be able to ask all the questions you want to. Now the way it will run as a ticketed event is that uh, food and drink will be included in the ticket um, to attend and you'll be able to, um, to enjoy both a panel interview with um, leading members of Zodiac as a brand but also get involved and ask your own questions um, and really be able to understand more about this brand, this fantastic brand which has emerged in recent years and which is, is drawing headlines. And so you'll gain exclusive access to Zodiac to be able to ask any questions about new releases, uh, upcoming uh, um, products, designs, um, and the future of the brand. Uh, in fact, anything else you can think of. And really having seen what Zodiac have in the works coming up in the next few months, there's an enormous amount to look forward to. But in an industry which is often very closed and which doesn't tend to let an awful lot slide to the average consumer or someone who simply likes their watches, this is a fantastic opportunity to be able to ask some, some important questions and understand the brand even more deeply. Now the tickets are currently available on Eventbrite um, and there are only 50 which are going to go for this event due to it being rather an exclusive um, look, an exclusive event to, to keep numbers down and keep, um, uh, keep things interesting for those who, who do attend. So they're available on Eventbrite which you can find via the link down below or indeed simply by going um, through the thewatchchronicle.com website, which will also have access to the Eventbrite um, link for you to get tickets. During the evening you'll have drinks uh, included in the, the ticket, as well as, as the opportunity to enjoy the time with everyone from the brand, and really be able to see the most, uh, and get the most of the opportunity. To be kept up to date with developments about the event or ones in future, do subscribe to the watchchronicler.com newsletter which is available um, on the website very easily and which will give you regular updates about new releases um, and, and articles as well as videos and podcasts but also about these events so you're always abreast. Now in addition to that um, one does have to look at different sides and this is the main thrust of this podcast which is incidentally now available on um, Apple platforms so you can now get this podcast through Apple um, and listen to it there. But a main aspect um, of this podcast was to speak about the situation with uh, Baselworld, with um, uh, Watches and Wonders, these events which are taking place, and also the impact of coronavirus. Now, um, incidentally, Jonathan from Page and Cooper produced a video on that very subject at the weekend, which I'd encourage you to listen to and watch, because it's a piece which, um, which shows things from a, a watch seller's perspective. From my perspective as a, a journalist, this is an important consideration. Because first and foremost, um, if we address the coronavirus side to this, um, one sees the fact that this is a situation where uh, human lives are at risk. Um, just under 3,000 reported deaths have taken place as a result of it. 
Um, and one really can't, can't overstate the fact this is a, a real tragedy, um, seeing this, uh, this loss of life, um, and, and the fact that at the moment it still isn't under control, and there is still a threat to people. Um, and now I'm no doctor, I'm no scientist, um, but before we talk about watches, it's worth considering and accepting the, the risks and the, the, um, the threat which this poses, and the fact that it is a tragedy which is much more important than, than watches as a theme. However, the impact on the watch world seems to be pretty profound, because whatever sort of watch you might have, whether it's um, something uh, very, very affordable, um, or whether it's something reasonably high-end, Swiss-made or not, the chances are there are components which come from China or that area. Now, at this stage, perhaps that doesn't even matter anymore because of the spread of this virus. But in any case, the, the fact is that um, supplies of watches in China and factories producing piece, pieces of watches like cases, like springs um, and movement parts um, are running on extremely low capacity or are simply closed. Now, this comes as a small surprise, and quite frankly, it's right to, to close these for people's safety. Um, but even factories which are still open are unable to uh, run at full capacity, or at sometimes capacity at all, because of the fact that um, earlier stages of production aren't able to take place in other areas and factories. And the truth is that whatever watch you have, um, it's likely that a large proportion of its mass or its, its, um, its volume is taken up by parts made in that area of the world. Um, Swiss made is defined by value. 60% of a watch has to be Swiss to be called Swiss made. And even then, um, there are, are discrepancies and grey areas. Um, and the fact is that at this stage, a lot of watches which you see for affordable prices, reasonable prices, have these components. And in recent years, um, watch case factories, for example, in Germany have closed down. The quality coming out of Germany um, isn't what it used to be. Uh, and Switzerland is, uh, is going through a time of, of change too. So it's unsurprising that an awful number of watches are produced um, in, in Southeast Asia in general. Certainly most Seikos, for example, which you buy aren't Japanese watches. They're Japanese designs, but they're made in, um, in, in other countries in that area, uh, depending upon which model you have or, um, or which year. But this does reveal just the, the impact which closed factories have and will have on watches. Now, what we're noticing across the board is that brands are starting to run out of supply. This isn't a, 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 an incredible phenomenon. A lot of brands, certainly in the high-end realms, um, control their supply very, very carefully. But most importantly, watches which in the past you could expect to get very quickly from uh, more affordable brands, you now just can't get. Whether that's because they're um, not as large companies as you would expect, or simply because their position um, as a result of the closed factories in China has changed, um, the way we look at watches, whether affordable or expensive, is probably going to go further in the direction of having to wait for something exclusive and buy it when it's available um, than waiting for it. And so in some ways, the strange um, change in the Rolex market in recent years um, has shown something more widespread than simply the controlled um, production which Rolex is using. Um, and is symptomatic of an industry-wide change. But I think one also has to look at the changing role of trade shows, because the coronavirus situation um, has drawn, drawn our eyes to whether or not Baselworld, most specifically, will still run this year. Now, to give you a, a brief outline of the situation with these things, in a general sense, trade shows are on the way out, I would say. Certainly there's been a lot of reporting on the situation in the automotive industry, um, in the automobile industry. A lot of um, uh, journalists have mentioned the fact that it doesn't really make sense anymore to attend these trade shows because of the fact that um, one's still able to see the car, um, or in, in my case, the watch, further down the line. Um, and the fact that because of, of the internet, because of social media, it's very unlikely that the, re the, the, the uh, reception for an article or a piece about a new release um, will actually make the, the headlines or even justify the price of visiting the show. Now, from a brand's perspective, this is, is unsurprisingly a concern. Uh, I know even small booths at Baselworld cost in the region of a million euros for the week. Now, you can imagine for a brand selling £1,000 watches um, in, let's say, 300-piece run, um, 300 runs, 
um, of each model with a few models, how many watches they would have to sell um, to have enough margin to be able to pay for their presence at Baselworld. Um, it's simply enormous. So that's something which has pushed brands away. And now the Swatch Group has pulled away for political reasons, it seems, and disagreements with, with Baselworld. Um, and I think at this stage, um, this would be uh, the second year without a Swatch presence. And interestingly, Swatch, because of the coronavirus situation, has cancelled its own trade show. So it's very likely that Swatch is going down the route of having small press events to demonstrate a watch in an exciting manner for the, the lucky few who happen to be members of the press. And selfishly, this is, this is great to see in terms of being involved with these things. But at the same time, it does remove that public presence. So that's something to consider. Now, at this point, we've seen Citizen, uh, along with, um, with Bulliver, the brand it owns, uh, pulling out of, of Baselworld for this year. Breitling has left. Um, Bulgari has also left. Um, and Seiko, Grand Seiko uh, and Casio have, have, have all gone too. Um, amongst others, quite frankly, it's, it's a, a sort of mass exodus from this show. Now, only time will tell whether the show, which is uh, Watches and Wonders in Geneva, will help to resurrect the trade show as something new, something much more audience-based. Um, and these are taking place in, uh, on consecutive weeks in Switzerland. Um, but with the current coronavirus situation, it's, it's still very much um, a guessing game as to whether they'll run, um, as to whether it's worth the cost, as to whether people will turn up. With 30% of luxury watches um, selling in, in Southeast Asia, in China uh, and elsewhere, it's clear that one wouldn't want to spend that kind of money if a market isn't going to turn up. And now, in the last 24 hours, we've seen the first appearance of coronavirus in Switzerland, um, which came over the border from, um, from Italy. Um, and in Italy, it's, it's very tragic. 11 reported deaths have taken place. Um, and so it is a, a growing problem. But one does now have to ask whether these shows will go ahead, whether they'll be able to go ahead, or whether this coronavirus situation will be the final nail in a coffin for uh, Baselworld and other trade shows. From my perspective, uh, running an event like the one you heard about at the beginning of this podcast is much more worthwhile than spending the same sort of money to attend Baselworld. And so this year, I don't know whether I'll be attending. And certainly, I know that a lot of other individuals in my position in uh, the journalist side of, of the watch industry um, are seriously considering whether it's worthwhile going or not um, because of the amount of money it'll cost to stay there for two weeks. Because, of course, one has Watches and Wonders the week before because this is, this, this is a significant investment. And in a media age where every, everything comes out at once and where people don't actually have to attend the show to see new products, the concept of these shows feels obsolete. But that's one aspect which um, I think is important to, to present to you, my, my audience. Um, I'd be very interested to hear what you think about whether or not um, it's still worthwhile to go to Baselworld, whether you'd prefer more content posted from the UK um, about a variety of other themes like interviews with leading industry members here um, in the UK. I have an interesting interview coming up in a few months um, and I'm sure more and more appearing here on the podcast. So it's worth looking out for those. Um, and also whether you think that um, small community-based watch events or large trade shows are the future, um, because this is, is something very important at the moment. And I do get the distinct sense that um, large brands are beginning to question this. Certainly that's because the success of uh, watch clubs and watch, uh, watch enthusiasts groups have grown, has grown fantastically. It's a brilliant community which has been created around watches, around horology, and around simply what we enjoy. So seeing this, uh, these unfortunate events pose a problem for the large trade shows may well change the way the industry operates. But tell me what you think in the comments section down below if you're listening to this podcast on YouTube or on the watchchronicle.com website. And of course, follow us or subscribe, depending upon where you're, you're listening to this podcast, whether it's on Apple, SoundCloud, Spotify, um, the website, or on YouTube. But in any case, thank you very much for listening. This is Armand from watchchronicle.com. Out.